All right, good morning once again. If you have your Bibles, you can be turning to the book of Ephesians. We're going to once again be in chapter number 6. Today we're going to talk about where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. The portion of the armor of God we're dealing with this morning concerns the feet coverings. Now some people call them the shoes of peace. I've simply entitled the sermon, Feet Shod. If you read on the subject of the armor of God, there are many different opinions as to the meaning of verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 6. If we're careful in our study this morning, we'll be able to see in the wording and in the symbolism some great truths. So we're going to be looking primarily at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, but let's begin as we have been in verse number 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The symbolism of feet denotes our walk. Now, as we've been studying the armor of God, we know that we have started our journey with the belt of truth, because again, truth is where everything needs to start. If you don't have the true gospel, how are you going to be saved? If you don't have the true Lord, how are you going to know him? So again, we start with truth. Truth leads us to understand that our righteousness is not sufficient, and therefore we need the righteousness of God. And by faith, we receive his righteousness and gain life, eternal life, which is that breastplate of righteousness then we wear. It's not our own righteousness, but it is the righteousness of God through faith. Once the righteousness of God is given to us, there is, or rather there should be, a change in our lives. Anybody remember 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's a change, right? If we're in Christ, if we have the righteousness of Christ through faith, if we're in Christ, it means we are a new creature. And since we are a new creature, then, it means that our walk should change. Now, our feet, then, are to be gird or bound under. To hear the phraseology, when it says, your feet shod, it's literally binding other. And you have to think about the shoes of the first century. What were the shoes of the first century like? <laughs> they weren't Nikes. They didn't have any Velcro. Okay, Pretty much flat sole bound on the foot with some laces. Sandals, if you will. Kind of like the flip-flops. If you uh, had maybe some more of the military, you would have the ones that had the straps or the laces that would go up the leg, holding them more secure. But really, they're just simple, something to protect the bottom of the feet as you walk. Well, shoes were crude by today's standards, but if we think about shoes and then think about this is the armor of God, we're going into battle. In those days, the vast majority of soldiers were footmen. They walked where they went. When they went into battle, they walked. They ran, but they were on their feet. They didn't have the, the, the benefit of, of tanks and planes and the things that we have today. They were footmen. They were soldiers. In order to run into the battle, you would need protection on your feet because a lot of times on the battlefield, if you're fighting in an open, natural field, there's going to be rocks and stones and holes and all sorts of different things that could trip you up. You don't want to stumble. You don't want to get your feet injured. So we have to have our feet protected. Well, what will the protection for our feet be in the spiritual warfare? 
Again, reading the verse, it says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When we call them the shoes of peace, we're forgetting something. We're leaving out a word. And that word is the word preparation. Now, to be prepared, we think about preparing, that's a verb. But this is the preparation, this is a noun. It is in what we know in the, in the Greek, it's in what's called the dative case. And there's three purposes for the dative case in, in Greek. Excuse me if I said Hebrew, Greek. Uh, the dative case in Greek identifies the indirect object of a verb. It explains how something is done or it explains with what something is done. And it is the latter of these that is used here. It explains with what something is done. With what are the feet shod? It is shod with the preparation. You say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Well, let me explain it this, word, it this way. Our feet are protected by the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. From the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The gospel prepares us. It prepares us for a few things. So we have to ask ourselves, okay, really quickly, what is the gospel? Good news. Easiest place to find the gospel in the scriptures. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So what is the gospel? What is the good news? Paul sums it up here as... The death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is the good news. How can a crucifixion, a death, and a burial be good news? Because of the third part, the resurrection. Because he came forth out of the grave, we know he conquered death, hell, and a grave, and he does the same thing for us. But the gospel then prepares us for some things. Because the gospel reminds me that I do not stand by my own power. It goes back to the breastplate of righteousness. It's not my righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. It is that imputed righteousness that has been given to me by God, by faith. So the gospel reminds me that I do not stand in my own power. So if I'm going to fight in the spiritual warfare... And I'm going to have the opportunity to stand in that battle. I will be protected by the preparation of the gospel knowing I do not stand there on my own. I do not stand there in my own power, but in the power of Christ. The gospel reminds me also that the old man should be buried. Just as Christ was placed in the grave... We are supposed to put away the old man. Let him be buried. Not dig him up. But let him be buried. Let him be put away. Because I'm going to walk now in newness of life. And we could cross-reference Romans chapter 6 talking about the symbolism of baptism. That we were buried with reference to Christ. Even so, we're going to rise with newness of life. We're supposed to walk then differently. So the gospel reminds me I don't stand in my own power. It's in the power of Christ. The gospel reminds me that the old man of sin needs to be buried and left there. But the gospel also reminds me that we have an everlasting hope. As I mentioned, because Christ raised from the dead, we have hope. It is an eternal hope. It is an everlasting hope. These things are what the gospel reminds me of. These things are the things that the gospel prepares me for. Knowing these things then should alter my behavior. 
I ask you to turn your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number 1. As Paul was writing to the Philippian church, verse 27 of chapter 1. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Our conversation. Paul was encouraging the Philippians, and he says, Your conversation needs to be as becometh the gospel of Christ. The word conversation, we could think about it as lifestyle. Your lifestyle needs to fit with the gospel message. My lifestyle needs to fit with the gospel message. What does the gospel again tell me? It tells me Christ died for my sins. Can I take any pride in my own salvation? cannot. If I'm going to glory, I glory in Christ alone. But it also tells me that Christ sacrificed himself for the world. What should I do if I'm going to walk in the footsteps of Christ? My life is supposed to be given up for the furtherance of the gospel of peace. It means I'm supposed to live the life of Jesus. Paul said, For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. He gave his life for us. We should now live our lives for him. This is what the gospel tells me. And so, as Paul says, let our conversation or our lifestyle be as becometh or be as fitting of the gospel message. The world today needs to see an accurate representation of Christ. The problem is many who call themselves Christians are not living lives that are fitting of the gospel message. And so what is the picture of Christ that is seen by the world? There's a lot of confusion Paul says our lives are supposed to become befitting of the gospel of Christ. Why did Christ die on the cross? Because of love. What should be my main motivating factor today? Love. But Jesus Christ died in the truth. So what do I give? I give the truth in love. It's not compromising standards, but it's telling people the truth because we love them. If I give them a lie and I validate their sin, it's not really loving. But Paul also goes on to say to the Philippians, he says that whether I come and see you or else I be absent, I may hear of your affairs. They weren't supposed to just live the gospel while Paul was with them. You see, our Christianity is not supposed to be just something we do on Sundays. It's not just something we do when somebody's watching. But we are supposed to live a life that becometh the gospel at all times. Having the integrity. I was reminded the last couple of weeks, have you ever seen those bloopers when somebody thinks that their mic is off? and the camera goes to somebody else, but you still hear their voice, and they say something really incriminating. It's called a hot mic moment. There are so many people that, that kind of, if when we think nobody's watching, we'll be somebody else. When we think nobody's watching, we'll say something. When we, when we want to fit in with the crowd, we'll say something different. Look, we don't need to have any of these hot mic moments. We need to be the same person at all times, and that person needs to be somebody who is having a lifestyle that is fitting with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But then Paul goes on to say here in verse 27, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul wanted the Philippian church to all be walking the same direction, to be walking in unity and striving, not against one another, but striving with one another, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, to further the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. The faith, our system of belief. The faith that we receive in the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing that the gospel teaches me I do not stand in my own power. That the gospel teaches me the old man needs to be put away. That the gospel teaches me we have an everlasting hope. It should alter my behavior. It should alter the way I walk. What will protect me in the spiritual warfare is if I remember the things that the gospel has prepared me for. I stand on the gospel. I stand on the Word of God. And let's just use for an example. Turn your Bibles back to the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Psalm number 119. The longest division in the Psalms. Longest chapter in the Bible, if you will. Majority of it speaks about the Word of God. I want to just pick out a couple of verses here. The first one is verse number 9. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? That question. How can a young man know how to do what's right? How can a young man walk in righteousness? How can a young man walk in the ways of God? It's real simple. The end of the verse, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Stand on the scriptures. Stand on the word of God. Stand on the gospel. It will protect you in your walk of life. Drop down in the psalm to verse number 11. One probably we already have memorized. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The more we follow the scriptures, the less we will sin. Are we going to be perfect? No. That doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to be. And the only way for us to live a life that is Christ-like is to live by the word of God. And the only way we're going to live by the word of God is if we take it and put it in our hearts so that it will come out in our lives. Computers, they only spit out what's put in. Pretty much we could say for the human as well, garbage in, garbage out. Good things in, good things out. Are you putting the word of God in so that good things come out? And drop down to verse number 105 in the Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God is the lamp to our feet. It shines before us and shows us every rock, shows us Every hole shows us the clear path to walk in. The word of God illuminates our path and helps us to walk. We walk literally by the word of God. So to make the application, if we walk according to the principles of the word of God, we will avoid the sharp stones or the crevices of sin which would seek to hinder us and ruin our testimony. Following the gospel and living 
to pursue its spread across the world prepares us to walk amidst the spiritual battle with where Satan seeks to destroy us and to destroy again the testimony of the children of God. And so if I may ask, upon what do you walk today? Are you prepared by the gospel to walk a life pleasing unto the Lord? Do you believe the gospel? goes back to, do you have the righteousness of God by faith? Today, I share the truth with you, the eternal truth of God. And again, I ask the question, does your life show others what you believe about Christ and about the gospel? Is it a life filled with humility, love, truth, faith, We'll talk more about faith in the coming weeks. But are your feet shod with the preparation, with the readiness that the gospel of peace gives to us? Are your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Father in heaven, thank you again for this time we have together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your blessings. God, thank you that you have given us the gospel that reminds us of what you've done for us, your death, your burial, your resurrection. It reminds us, Lord, that we need to be a new creature in Christ and, Lord, to walk in a manner that becomes the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Father God, I pray that you would help your children to be truly shod under their feet with the preparation that the gospel gives. Help us to walk a life that would be pleasing to you that we would be striving, Lord, to share the gospel of peace with others, that they too would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And Father, I pray for those who do not know Jesus Christ. I pray that they would come to know him before it's eternally too late. And God, we just want you to receive all honor and glory and praise because it's only through you we can be anything. It's only by your grace and mercy we can be your children. So thank you for those things. God, I just pray you'd have your will and way in the remainder of our service. God, I just pray you'd bless the invitation. And God, again, I just pray you'd open the hearts of the hearers. And God, move us according to your plan. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for loving us. And it's in Christ Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.